All right, hey we're everyone. live. We're live. Welcome. Welcome to the last kind of episode of the week. Of the week, Friday. It's the last day. We're back on Monday. Tune in every day, 9 Central Standard Time. Like and subscribe. As always, we've got a lot of new subscribers, which is awesome. Appreciate so if you want more appreciate. of this content, you want more religion, art, and technology, make sure to like and subscribe. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? <laughs> We are talking about censorship. Well, I thought we were going to talk about <laughs> Donna Heroin, a cyborg man. Oh, are we? We can talk about censorship too. She talks about that. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer Donna. Okay, okay let's do Donna because I'm going to do Donna Haraway, a cyborg man manifesto. Sounds good. All right, so a cyborg manifesto. What is it? It's an essay that Donna Haraway writes in 1985. So how many years ago was that? <laughs> That was 36 years ago. 36 years ago. Um, so quite a long time ago. So why is it important? So it was written 36 years ago. Well, Donna Haraway is kind of like Carl Sagan. So if you guys, I know a lot of you guys are really into Carl Sagan, like me. And uh, trust me, we're going to have a bunch of stuff about Carl Sagan. I grew up watching him since I was a little girl, and he inspired me to study what I study today. But another person to kind of expose yourself to, if you're interested in Carl Sagan, is Donna Haraway. Uh, so why is Donna Haraway like Carl Sagan? She had a very similar emphasis to Carl Sagan. So her emphasis was on how machines, specifically computers, were going to change humans. We're going to change human civilization and humanity in general. So that was her focus because she knew early on, this way back in 1985, this is... Uh, so the internet was obviously created in 1969, but it doesn't really get big till later in the 90s. Um, infamously in 1991, they go to donate some of the early equipment for the internet to the Smithsonian and they get turned down because the Smithsonian calls the internet a fad in 1991. <laughs> so <laughs> this is 1985. So it's all of this is very new. The digital age is really hasn't yet begun. Uh, so, but she really prophesizes everything that's going to happen. So what does she prophesize that is so important? Well, she warns that machines are going to fundamentally transform human identity. So you know these categories that we have, gender, race, ethnicity, sex, mm -hmm. you added all these different identity categories we have. Donna Haraway warns that they're going in the past. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be no longer with us. Why is that? Because with machines, it allows us to take on new identities. Yeah. Allows us to be anonymous lots of the time. It allows us to impersonate. It allows for all these things. She argues that machines are going to make identity from sex, gender, race, ethnicity. Everything's going to be fluid. Things are going to be dynamic. Yeah. She predicts all this in 1985. And she also warns that feminism is behind the times. So Donna Haraway, when she writes in 1985, now she's like a beloved figure and all this stuff. But when she was writing this in 1985, it was a polemic against feminism. Hmm. It was very polemic. And her issue with feminism was it was becoming too rooted in categories of identity. And she prophesied that these categories were gonna be in the past and that actually you didn't wanna be associated with these identity categories, which she argued would later become uh, kind of associated with conservatism. Hmm. So it's kind of an interesting, because I feel like the reason I wanted to bring up Donna Haraway, again, she's written a lot of other books, which we will talk about later, um, Staying with the Trouble, which is more recent. Um, but this one is really what kind of gives way to everything. So she argues as a polemic against feminists, says get away from identity categories. Stop identifying yourself according to these categories because they're in the past and instead try to build a broad coalition. Hmm. Like just kind of get outside of it and embrace the dynamic fluidity that is coming. So what would you have to say about identifying as ish community of woman womanhood like that's her issue yeah is that's how feminism was going feminism was going like this community of womanhood and she was arguing that machines are going to transform womanhood that what we're going to see as womanhood is is not going to be so her kind of argument was this investment wasn't going to pay off moreover this 
kind of notion of womanhood, she argued, would probably be co-opted by conservative movements later on. So to be part of this, well, I'm part of this identity group and this, 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 and this, she argued was actually a politically conservative bent because for her, categories of identity, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, are of the early centuries. They are not of the 21st century. So in the 21st century and beyond, Haraway prophesies that new categories will emerge that we don't yet know. And of course, I think those categories are coming to formation right now, right? Like, are you a crypto? Like, you know, like, are you an Ethereum or a Bitcoin or how, how do you identify, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. are you a Bitcoiner? Like, you know, are you a crypto? Are you into that? I think that's a category that's coming to be. Yeah. You know, like I, I, are you into ETH or BTC or how do you define yourself? <laughs> I think that these categories are becoming more important as systems of organization. I think whether or not you believe in aliens or not is becoming a new category of identity that doesn't fit previous religious categories. Our previous identity categories were like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all that stuff. Now it's like, do you believe in aliens or not? That's a completely different setup. Yeah. Yeah. So she uses, she calls it a cyborg manifesto. What's the cyborg? The cyborg is anything. It is everything. It is anything. Think about what a cyborg is. It doesn't have a race, ethnicity, sex, gender, yet it can be all of those things simultaneously. So to give you an example, let's say I can go on Twitter and I can be anyone I want. Yeah. Rather than repudiate that, as I'm starting to see people being like, well, you should, in order to sign up for a Twitter account, you should have to have your ID. And use your idea. I'm seeing people say that now. I know it's scary, but you're seeing that, which is she argues is a politically, very politically conservative reaction. And we should be afraid of that because of where that can go. We're all burners. There is no burner account. Yeah, exactly. We're all burners. We all have burner accounts. That's the greatest defense of Kevin Durant. uh, When he was having a burner account, he just trash people. (laughs) just trash. And then they found out he had a burner account. He's like, okay, I'm sorry. I'll just trash people with my real account. No, I... I, I love Kevin Durant, I must say. I will go to bat for Kevin Durant. Yes. Because I am 100... (laughs) I am very pro Kevin Durant. I wish, like... That's awesome. I wish more celebs. Well, I think a lot more celebs have burner accounts yeah. than we know. Yeah. And they're going out and trashing other people. Because sometimes, yeah. you know, like Kristen Teigen and stuff, like you see all that where mm. she was getting trashed. I think a lot of that was like other celebrities burner accounts <laughs> who were mad at her. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. It's all, it's its own sphere. Mm-hmm. And according to Haraway, we should embrace that. We should embrace it. It's fun. So in other words, uh, some might uh, have suggested that uh, an account account like Facebook is people trying to like, uh, it's people trying to uh, be very self-centered or like if you have too many photos of you, you're trying to like show to people who you are. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's actually just a multiplication of your identities. It's not that you've always had a desire to show Mm -hmm. off. And now you have this right. medium to show off and you're showing off. But no, I mean, it's just like, it's just something else. Mm. Me on Facebook is just a thing. Yeah, it's just a whole new, it's a whole, whole new, new thing. Identity, yeah. It is a cyborg. Yeah, it's a cyborg me. Yeah. It's a cyborg. To give you a quote, I love this quote from a cyborg manifesto. I think this might kind of yes. encapsulate yes. what you're trying to say. She writes, the cyborg does not dream of community from the model of the traditional family. Mm. This time without the Oedipo, uh, Oedipus complex project, the cyborg would not recognize the Garden of Eden. It is not made of mud and cannot dream of returning to dust. So it's not of the flesh. It's not of the family. It's not mother. It's not father. Mm. Yet it's all of those things simultaneously. And so it's not of the flesh. So it's not of these categories of identity. For her, who is the cyborg? Us. It's interesting. The moment my dad passed away, my brother is desirable to just collect all his Facebook statuses and photos. There was mm-hmm. not so much necessarily any attempt to go back home and visit his grave. It was mm-hmm. mostly to collect that cyborg on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, to go back on Facebook and do... Yeah, yeah. when he passed away, it was all about his Facebook was... 
how you work. interacted with yeah. him beyond the grave. Yeah. Ooh, oh, yeah. or not just beyond the grave, apart from the grave. Yeah. <laughs> Before his even, yeah. yeah like set a, the grave is set aside. Right, but it's the side work on Facebook that. But I feel like too you interacted him with him beyond the grave because a lot of the stuff too I was seeing about his funeral and all that stuff was through his account. Yeah, yeah. You know, like through Facebook, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Pictures of him as passed away mm -hmm. profile, going through yeah. pictures of him yeah. and stuff like that i thought that was very interesting too because yeah. the cyborg doesn't know time so the the cyborg's not doesn't dream of going back to dust it didn't it's not of the mud it's yeah. not of the substance so your it Facebook goes will on not go with you to your grave no it will it will persist beyond you mm -hmm. this is what i said it's like the most famous person alive today is a nobody so, the, well, one thing, the most famous person alive today in the future from this moment is likely right now a nobody. Yeah. So what's going to happen 100, 200 years from now? This person will arise and become kind of a monolith, become this hugely important figure just from their social media, mm -hmm. just from their digital accounts, their digital media. That's it. And that's how it will happen. And, it, and if you think, like I say, I use historical, you know, antecedents to make this argument like Jesus, who dies as a nobody, and then is becomes the most famous person in the world. Mm -hmm. um, Prophet Muhammad, kind of similarly, you mm -hmm. could use that story. Um, but also more recent, you could use um, George Floyd. Sure, yeah. Nobody knew who he was. <laughs> when he passed. It's you a know? great point, yeah. But it was only after death that he became. There's something about that, that you know, that you become more powerful well, after death. He was cyborg. He was 10 seconds or seven minutes of video, whatever long yeah, the video was. That's, that's who what I'm he saying. was. Yeah. That's who he was. That's who, exactly. Not whatever was after or before. Before, that's exactly. Nobody cared about his funeral. Exactly. No well, coverage. Well, no one cared about like previous life yeah, you know, or, or anything like life, that yeah, or who like, he was before. Yeah. It was what he was on digital media exactly. in those seconds, exactly. in those minutes. Yep. And that was what encapsulated. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a cyborg. Yep. So he became a cyborg in that way. Mm -hmm. And then it was after his death that he was able to propagate across the globe. Yeah. Really. I mean, BLM went across the globe and all that stuff. Yeah. So it was only in death where he became more powerful. So digital media, by becoming a cyborg. So the question that Haraway says is like, you know, how do you become a sub cyborg? Might be a question. You know, how how should you facilitate your cyborgness, or how what does it look like? Especially also with the rise of memes, right? So no person can escape a meme. Mm. You could be a meme at any particular given moment. Any moment in a sporting event, or it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a famous person. <laughs> yeah. Like that South Asian guy with the cricket photo who's like, you know, he's like that. They always <laughs> use him and like everything. I forget which one. Where he's talking. making that face like, oh, the Pakistani yeah. spectator? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the guy was like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, my, so you know the friends we met in Boston? Yeah. Who uh, gave you a little cold shoulder? Uh -huh. They went and met that guy no in way. England because he had become such a big name. They went, they met him, they uh, dressed like him, not just him, him and his wife and five other kids that I've been their friends with. Uh, oh my God. I can show you. They went to meet that guy. That guy is now like the official Pakistan cricket fan. Oh. Uh, yeah, wow. he's absolutely like, and he's just a common guy. He's just a sweet guy, according to my friend who I trust. Oh, you know? wow. Yeah. They physically went to meet him and took a photo with him. I mean, yeah, so exactly. There's a guy, bald yeah. guy. Yeah, in a match against Australia, Pakistan, Australia, fielder dropped a catch, World Cup cricket match 2019 mm -hmm. in Taunton, uh, England. And there was a guy standing and he was like, he made this very Pakistani face like, yeah, <laughs> like, like, what the hell is that? Come yeah, on, guys, you know, yeah, yeah. you guys got to ruin my it, Did he make it at the cricket game or soccer game? It was a cricket match. It was a cricket match. That's Pakistan, like Australia. Okay. Yeah. David Warner so batting. Sure. He top edged it. The guy at the third man region dropped the catch and he was standing just behind him as a spectator and he just went like <laughs> <laughs> and That's that encapsulated how all Pakistanis yeah, were feeling yeah, like really yeah. guys you guys gonna <laughs> drop this come on like 
because we have this historically known as bad standard of fielding. So it wasn't surprised. He wasn't shocked. He was just like disappointed that it's happening again. Yeah. It was that phase of encapsulated I, the emotions of the generic the, fans. The little girl who's pictured in that famous meme too, where the house oh, is yeah. on fire house behind her. Fire. She sold she's it now, as an NFT for like Now half she's a in million. college and she paid off all her loans. Oh, yeah. yeah. She yeah, sold yeah. it as an NFT for half a million dollars. Right. So these things like can propel in ways that you don't know. So it's the undead. Um, Wendy Chen calls digital media the world of the undead. Yeah. And it's only... And you can't control it. No, no, no. You cannot escape the meme. Which makes it monstrous. So this is a point. Donna Haraway says cyborgs are monstrous. Exactly. There is no notion of political freedom. Yeah, no. (laughs) It is the absolute unfreedom is the meme. Yeah. You just do not know when you'll be a meme. You have no control. And there's no legal no regulations. There's None. no legal regulations. You cannot like how do you unmean say, yourself. Yeah, you can't unmean it once it's out there. Yeah. Um, very interestingly, there there is a court case about something that was a meme that became on CNN and the yeah. family suing because the daughter's in that photo or yeah. whatever, you know? Yeah. And the courts threw it out recently. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no like legal way to like regulate the use of memes yeah yeah so that's a great example and yeah it's monstrous because a lot of people who were made memes didn't want to be memes yeah like luckily he's sure. probably cool with it yeah they say the sweet like, guy yeah yeah, he's yeah it sounds yeah. like he's kind of but a yeah. lot of people are not happy that they became memes yeah and there's there's a lot of <laughs> memes that have kind of um a nastiness to them sure, or you know what yeah. i mean so <laughs> I know it's kind of like, <laughs> but that's the scary thing about that's digital media. So maybe yeah. you can't really control it. Maybe, you know, this question of how do you become a cyborg or how mm. do you, maybe you can't, maybe there, there's a certain level of it's outside of your control of, of yeah. what happens to you after. And, and that's kind of the weird thing about becoming more powerful after you die and entering the world of the undead is that there your power is wrapped up in your lack of power yeah i also find interesting a lot of these memes have to do with emotion so the jordan crying the ball pakistani f- cricket fan being mm-hmm. a little disappointed then the most recent one on the sporting world is uh, um steve nash the coach of uh, new jersey nets new york mm-hmm. brooklyn nets hugging kevin durant after durant had the game five game winner he scored like 50 some points and that fit and he just played like the, every minute he did not mm-hmm. sit on the bench at all and uh nash gives him like a hug like, like yeah you know, like, yeah it's like a coach giving this fair like you're so important to me kind of like and everyone's like i wish friends gave me a hug like he gave me it's very interesting a lot of them have to do with these emotions like disappointment grief brotherhood like yeah. you know people are finding their ideal emotions through these memes yeah that's oh absolutely or the girl who uh, there's a fire burning i mean that's an emotional state of be like she is doesn't give a shit there's a fire yeah burning. they're all visual yeah and there is a, a, power. a certain emotional idea well they're you know? gestures they're just so yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why memes it's very interesting that memes would become powerful because ai can't read memes so mm-hmm. ai is very bad at getting gestures mm. very bad at it like facial gestures and understanding so ai cannot get our cyborg in other words uh, yeah and so that's another important point too about a cyborg a cyborg is not a robot i should say that sorry mm-hmm. um very important point for her in the book a robot is something that is just machine mm-hmm a cyborg is something that is human and machine. Yeah. Or it's a human working with a machine. Yeah. So she thinks, this is another important point in a cyborg manifesto, there will be no robots. hmm Which is actually more frightening, her scenario. Yeah. So her scenario is there will only be cyborgs. So that means your body is going to be commandeered by machines Mm-hmm. you i see i'm rather i'm cool with the robots because i'm like all right the robots they're out there they're like cool like, and, well they're not cool but you know what i mean like you can be like okay that's clear machine out there the fact that like people will become cyborgs is like really freaky because mm-hmm. they will become machinic yeah and that's one thing she warns about emotion that we're talking about right now is that machines have heightened emotions they don't have like kind of a tepid, you know, people have this sense that, oh, emotion, machines are emotionless. No, they're heightened emotion. 
So they go from boom to boom. They go one and zero. There is no like just kind of happy medium there. They either are angry or sad. <laughs> like, you know, mm-hmm. they exist in, in polars. Yeah. Kind of bipolar way to think about it. Mm-hmm. Just because of the way machinic languages function as yes, no, one, zero. Mm-hmm. Um, the, it, it, it functions in a binary. Machinic yeah. languages are binaries. Yeah, so you can think about machines like that. So they have really kind of these heightened emotions Mm -hmm. that have dramatic impacts on humans Mm -hmm. and can make us monstrous. If you think about emotions having the potential to make humans monstrous, because emotions can can make you a god. They can make you like divine, deity-like. If you think about it, because they have the ability to build empathy and compassion these are like the basic ingredients of civilization, mm-hmm. empathy, compassion. So without emotion, we don't have civilization. Yeah. Yet they also have the ability to have rage, mm-hmm. anger, and that's the basis for war and the collapse of civilization. So let's uh, elaborate the point of computers having emotions a little more. So mm-hmm. you, are you, do you mean like the memes on computers as computers having emotions? I'm just trying to conceptualize a computer having an emotion. What does well, that mean? Well, the computer doesn't have that emotion, but it's that the human is presenting it in machinic terms. Oh, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. Just wanted to but, clarify. But that's yeah. why, um, you know, you see those images, or, you know, the, the machines can't, don't have the capacity to see because the beauty of a meme is it doesn't have one meaning. No. You can take a meme and use it in any number of ways. No. And in fact... The, the context of the original meme is not how the meme's being used. No. So in that case, in the Pakistani yeah. guy, Even like there, yeah, his memes so. are being used in all, all these different contexts sure, yeah. um, that have nothing to do with a cricket match. Yeah, it doesn't have to do with it. Yeah, so in that case, and so this range of like variability of emotion is something only a human can do. Mm. Now, the machine can help the human. This is a good example. I think a meme is a good example of kind of a cyborg because you have a human kind of doing this emotional level, kind of using this meme in different ways mm-hmm. and contexts, and the machine is helping them, yep. guiding them yep. along with it and helping them create the meme. Yep. That's a cyborg. Yeah. So in Donna Haraway's perspective, we're already cyborgs. Right. That's another important point, too. With smartphones, computers, we are already, this human-machine mixture is already happening. Mm-hmm. So that's another important, important point. There is no, like, future cyborg. It's, mm-hmm. like, right at now. And and that's also really terrifying to me. <laughs> when I first read a cyborg manifesto, I was like, oh, well, you know, Skynet's not going to go live for, you know, <laughs> we got some time. Skynet, you know, and the Terminator when it goes live. Anywho, yeah, <laughs> that's the computer system. But I'm like, oh, you know, it's off in the distance. But then Donna Haraway's like, it's here right now. It already, <laughs> Skynet already went live. We're already in it. I was like, ah, oh my God, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, so that's kind of terrifying too. You know, like uh, I was reading this article. My right leg is dead. And oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. It is I so was, reading this article recently that was like would you know if the apocalypse happened or would it already have happened there's this great show on hbo about that uh i'm forgetting the name the leftovers the leftovers where like they're not sure if the apocalypse happened there's kind of like this ambivalence and it's like horrible you know they all the characters in the show don't know if the apocalypse actually happened they're pretty sure it did. That's the feeling I had reading Donna Haraway's The Cyborg Manifesto. I was like, <laughs> she seems to be describing an apocalyptic event. Has it passed already? Are we already in the apocalypse? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I had that sense in this because, yeah, we've already kind of this idea of like, well, you know, the tipping point is far out. No, we've already passed the tipping point and we're already in this new era of monsters. Mm. Chimeras, she says. Yeah. We're, we're in an age of monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see that. I see that. I mean, I feel like um, we're getting a lot of good and positives with digital media, but there's also like grotesqueness and horror. Like I was recently hearing about how social media was used to round up Uyghur Muslims in China. Like I was like, oh my God, I was reading this article and I was just like, oh my God, this is so sad and sick. And, you know, like to see digital media used for genocide, like, 
you know, they're, they're, we think of digital media as like, oh, sharing a meme, but it can also facilitate a genocide. Yeah. And those are things. And just like you said before, like you can't control it. Yeah. Nobody can control how it's used. Yeah. Like that's the scary thing. It can go either way. So I think in that case, that's why Donna Haraway's work is very important. And that's why I think she's very much like Carl Sagan because Carl Sagan is often represented like Donna Haraway as like pro technology. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah. You know, like I see Donna Haraway used a lot for like transhumanism. So transhumanism is the idea that we're kind of moving from humans to cyborgs mm -hmm. or like something else, or we can become like superhuman mm -hmm. if we merge with machines. But she's like super critical <laughs> against transhumanism in many ways, like very critical of what's happening, mm. you know, and the implications of this for society. Because, I mean, her work is filled with a lot of warnings that I think like all of her stuff that she warns about in 1985, we have like totally seen come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Like she says this battle over identity. Yeah. Because these frameworks of fleshly identity, of the identity of flesh is not the identity of machine or the identity of hardware. It's a, it's a different categories or you know another another example of another identity instead of like cryptocurrencies or something like that um if you're a bitcoin proponent another thing is if you're a mac user are you a mac user or you know your different mm -hmm. smartphones are you google do you have a google or do you have an apple you know like that and they jokingly say apple is like a cult or something you know people mm -hmm. sometimes say but what they're really saying is these are important categories of identity that are now shaping society yeah. Sorry, that's our dog in the background. <laughs> oh, she's always, you know, like before we do the show, she's like totally chill. She's just like hanging out. And then it's like, as soon as we go to like start the show, she's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to be a bad girl. <laughs> I'm going to be bad. And that's like her thing. So excuse her in the background being bad and tearing up my bed. Um, but yeah, so that that's what I think is really this these new categories. It's because you know I see a lot of people being like right versus left is an important category. I don't think that's an important category at all. Mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing is the falling away of these categories. Like when I talk to people, people don't define themselves as like I am a DNC supporter, or I'm a GOP supporter. I haven't heard anybody say that ever. Ever. Have you ever heard anybody even define themselves in those terms yeah, no, lately? I think, I think those two categories have definitely reached their, what's that, Nader or Zenith? What's the lowest point? Nader, right? Nader, Nader is the highest point. Wait, Zenith? Zenith is highest, I know <laughs> yeah. that. Nader would be the lowest. Yeah, right? yeah, I don't know. I don't know yeah. where words. Sorry, I know. Yeah, yeah, definitely yeah, nobody that's cares that's about GOP or DNC. Yeah, they, they, our political categories are like Absolutely. right, left. It's all, none of it works anymore. Yeah. Um, it's like, are you a Mac user? Are you not? Are you into, are you a Bitcoiner? Or are you all these new categories that are emerging, I think are far more important. You know, like I, and I think that our politics is still catching up. I think our politics is like a hundred years behind. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing is not, because I see a lot of people being like, oh, there's like, there's going to be a new, like, strong far right or far left or something. Okay, Zoe, that's enough. That's enough. We've had enough. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> she can't help herself. Um, so I say, um, I, I just don't think that's happening. I think there's just new categories that are coming back. Okay, there you go. Okay, finally. I swear, if she's like... <laughs> Just as soon as we go to start filming, she's like, I'm going to be bad. And I'm just going to like tear everything up. So question. So we have these new categories of identity. Make a very persuasive argument for that. Yeah. What does Dana Haraway say about what, did, what prescription does she have about how do we learn to live with these computers knowing they have such polar emotions? So if they can create such monstrosity, mm -hmm. how should we approach the cyborg? Yeah. That's a great question. We should be um, dynamic. We shouldn't be obsessed with like what we're being obsessed with. Yeah. And, like, you know, this idea of like, I am this and I believe. So the monstrosity is actually also a reaction against the dynamism and 
yes. reverting back to these. Yes, ideas. and it's a conservative. According to her, it's a politically conservative shift. Hence the genocide as well. Yeah. The Uyghur genocide can only happen yeah. if you have a Uyghur identity. Yeah. Which might not make much of a... Yeah. That is an well, old identity. It's an ethnic identity, right? It's yeah. Old yeah. And we're going to see the the wiping out in various ways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about like all that. With so the cyborg media. is the future and these identities are the monstrous trying to... It's... It doesn't us have latching to be on to the identity yeah. can create these monstrosities. Yeah, it right? can make like, us. It can make us really good too. It doesn't have to be monstrous. Yeah, but um, more like a chimera, I think, which is like a chimera isn't quite like a monster. It can go. It's kind of mm -hmm. like dynamic and mutates, and you know, a chimera can be like super helpful and yeah, be beneficial and like a friend. Yeah. Um, but as you as you know, to use that example, like you can be anybody on Twitter. Yeah. Eager, eager could be anyone on an app, mm -hmm. but those apps are being designed to track down the eager. Yeah. That pretty much encapsulates this point, right? That we can be anyone, but now we're being made to be someone and we're actually being be tracked made down. To be someone and and be that's tracked. where the monstrosity yeah. is coming from. Lighting marginally better today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh, that's my favorite, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're working on it. When we get to um when we get to Florida, we're doing a whole new marked improvement. <laughs> we're gonna have amazing lighting once we get to Florida and stuff. So got that in the works, but not till we get to Florida in a few weeks. All right, on that note, we'll see you Monday. <laughs>